what we're going to be talking about today are Markov chains. For those of you who don't know, Markov chains are a type of predictive algorithm. They're not actually machine learning. They're not actually AI. And that's why they can potentially make for faster log analysis. So what I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about myself and uh, how these things can work. And then I'll give you some pro tips on how to get started. And then at the end, I'm gonna be giving you some, like how we can collaborate because we're all on this journey together. So a little bit about myself. Hey, I'm Mick. I've been a SANS instructor for 15 years. I am um, also a member of the INS faculty. While my consultancy, InfoSec Innovations, does do penetration, surface, penetration testing services, that's a small part of our book of business. We're mainly a defensive shop. We're a very purple company. And I love defense. And one of the things that makes me really sad and has for decades at this point is that every single time we've done incident response, there is ample evidence available that could have been used better. So let's get a little bit better about some stuff. Now, a little warning, I'm not a data scientist. My undergrad is in telecommunications, so I approach this a bit differently than some data science purists. If I get things wrong, call me out. I won't take any offense. I'm on this path, and uh, for some of you, I'm a rookie. Um, that said, I do have deep subject matter expertise in things of networking and systems controls. Um, I got into the ML space with uh, in the uh, late 2000s when we were having like that massive influx of spam. Uh, we found that Bayesian filtering of spam was the way to go, but uh, a lot of snake oil vendors were claiming that they were doing Bayesian when they weren't. And I had to learn out like why this is happening because I was also helping to manage uh, uh, mail systems. So what I've done is I've made a career out of quote unquote basic stats. I help a lot of organizations with anomaly detection, setting up their SIM, tuning EDRs, things like that. And I got to tell you, there is still a lot of meat on these bones. For those of you who are trying to up the defensive capabilities of an organization, start leaning in here because um, you can make some very impressive headway. If management and leadership is telling you, oh, we got to AI all the things, there are plenty of basic statistical modeling techniques that can actually be called AI if you take a view that an AI system is something that makes decisions without human input. I'll say that again, you can claim that base stats are actually AI because it doesn't take human input. Now, I recently took SANS 595, shout out to Dave Holzer, it's an amazing class, it rekindled, I, I loved math in high school, um, college killed my love of math. Um, but I gotta tell you, if you're on the fence about this class, take it and um, it's, it's a good stuff. So um, what we're gonna be talking about in the time remaining is why we have Markov chains, um, some potential use cases, and I'm also gonna share with you some problems that I've had over the years in implementing and playing with these. So part one, why? So this next slide is just one man's opinion. Don't like overanalyze this, okay? Um, I think of data science, specifically within the information security space, as a continuum of options that we have. And so if you think about all the methods of analysis, this, this uh, gradient that we've got here, and I got easy and hard in quotes, that's judgy, right? And what's easy for me might be hard for you and vice versa. I just threw some model like analysis types up here. And this is just kind of me top of mind thinking what I find difficult, okay? Now, what's weird is when GPT-3 became publicly available, all of a sudden everybody was like, oh, we got to AI all the things. And immediately every organization overnight said, we got to do the hard because it's going to make life better. And the thing is, the harder something is, the more black box magic it's seen as. And um, I've, I've done a lot of consulting in the space and I hate to say it, but this is actually a direct quote from someone. Can't we just throw all the data to the AI and let it figure it out? And that's a recipe for disaster. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it, it bears repeating. And maybe for you know, those of you who are watching this recording, you can play this to management. This is why we have such a high failure rate for these sorts of projects. You can't just throw 
the, the data over the wall and hope it helps. It's dangerous. You're going to be having wasted compute. And for goodness sakes, like we like we're burning electricity that we probably shouldn't be. And more uh, critically, it's incorrect findings. Now, thankfully, and I, I say this with all due disrespect, thankfully, typically in the infosec space, life isn't on the line. Because if it were, like our false positive rate is like a butcher's bill. So we can and should do better. So what I'm advocating that you try to do is do more of this easy stuff. And I would contend that Markov chains may fit in here if you use them in the right appropriate cases. They're com computationally cheap-ish. They're a little more expensive than doing things like calculating the median or finding uh, standard deviations. Those are real cheap, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper than doing things like neural nets or using um, like, like uh, genetic algorithms, for goodness sakes. So what Markov uh, chains do a great job of is detecting state changes. And this is a little bit of an interesting quirk because we're used to models or tools that will say, hey, this thing's anomalous. Markov chains do not care about anomalies. They just say, hey, this thing is changing from in one state to another state, or hey, it's staying state. And it's up to you to know what is the expected. Am I supposed to stay at this state or am I supposed to change that state? Now, let's talk about use cases of how you can use that state modeling to your advantage. So I love doing Markov as a very quick pass when a client turns on a log or maybe they're just getting started out on their security journey. Logs that are just fired up are beautiful for Markov analysis because a Markov chain does not need to do deep learning. It doesn't need to do that sampling. It's just doing off of a short run of sample data. So that it's beautiful. I highly recommend it. Whoops. Okay. Um, the, the con though is you need to know what's good or bad. And this is the tricky bit. Remember, I said it in passing and it bears repeating, Markov chains don't understand good or bad. They just say, hey, here's the state. It's up to you to know what that state means. And this is one of the reasons that I think that um, these are a little slower to be used in mainstream uh, data science and information security, because it's not enough to just understand the algorithm. algorithm. You also have to have deeper subject matter expertise to challenge it. Hey, there was the state change. Okay, so what? Hey, a user logged in. So what? You know, that could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on the context. And what Markov chains, what I like to use them for, for things like this, for new logs, is finding changes and then start having those, do these changes matter? Spoiler alert, a lot of these won't. So I'm not saying that Markov chains are amazing. What I am saying is that they're a light touch, quick way of doing things, okay? Now, if you're wanting to get started, what I would encourage you to do for this particular use case, sit down, like hands off keyboard, maybe get some folks, get some nice coffee, and think, all right, we got this log. What are the, the possible outcomes that we can get from this log? You can get failed login, we can get successful login, we can get um, was successful but not allowed to log in for various reasons, right? Like those are the sorts of things that you're gonna be thinking about what these outcomes are and then see actually do they happen in the real world? One of the things that um, is really challenging, the second bullet point, manually force, is all too often we have these logs or we think we have these logs, but we're not tuned to actually generate them. Anybody that's done any kind of analysis in the cloud, you know that the default cloud logging levels are not your friend, right? Okay, there's some people like wincing, I'm sorry. I don't mean to trigger you. So you're gonna actually have to test, do we actually even get that because all too often, as somebody who does uh, pen testing and sim tuning, when I do a purple team engagement, a lot of times I send an attack. I'm like, hey, you all see that? And they're like, let us know when the attack even starts. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Here's 
Here's another use case that I like, and this one's kind of nifty. You can use them for fine tuning your alert thresholds. So, in this, I, I'm kind of reluctant to say this in a recorded, <laughs> but one of the things that is a big problem in the industry is when you set up a rule, like you, you're setting up a SIM or you download some kind of Yara, they have this threshold that they're like, oh yeah, this number is, is bad and you need to act. Has that person done anything in your environment? Right, they have no idea. That threshold could be absolutely meaningless. So one of the things that is kind of interesting that you can do with Markov chains, and I've actually had some really cool success with them, is you can start using that to see what the clipping, the alarm threshold is for a particular resource, what that condition might be. Also, I have used this to validate, like you'll, you'll find that SIM uh, SOC engineers will have like gut suggestions of like, hey, here's what I think is a good level. You can use that to validate it. So to get started, find a rule that you like but isn't performing as well, or maybe people tell you it's popular and it's not performing well. Be prepared to push back on the results though. Again, Markov chains, more than many algorithms, require you to really think about the data that you're working with and understand what the outcome of those logs mean. Now, Odd user behaviors are actually one where I'm spending a lot of research on right now. Post login, users are boring. I mean, not, not the users, their behaviors are boring, right? They do the same thing over and over again. This is an exquisite use case, I think, for Markov. Um, the one downside that I will warn you about is you're gonna potentially have a massive increase in your log volume. Now, to get started, Here's something that you need to think about. Because it could be a massive increase in your log volume, figure out what stories you want to tell and then reverse engineer the logs you need to collect in order to tell that story. Also, carefully review your CTI feeds. If they're good CTI feed, they will tell you what attackers do once they land on an environment. That, that, um, I don't care what tool or technique the attackers are using to get into the environment, once they land, their attacker behavior is gonna just be different. So here, I wanna warn you about a couple issues that you're gonna to have to uh, be mindful of. So I think there's two reasons that Markov chains aren't too popular in cybersecurity. The first one is states. A lot of people don't know what the states are, or maybe if they know what the states are, they don't know the meaning of them. Also, there's a thing called state explosion. If you make too many states, the Markov model, it's incredibly expensive. The other one, and this one's a little more subtle, is if you read the papers about Markov chains, there's a thing called Markov property. Vastly simplified, and please purists don't like throw stones or anything. What this says is a Markov model is dependent on the present moment, like what's happening right now, not what happened before. Y'all, there's a lot of incursion traffic. There's a lot of attack behaviors that actually do well in time series analysis. That's not a Markov problem, okay? So we'll wrap up here. There's no silver bullets in this space. Anybody who's telling you otherwise is selling you something or doesn't understand the complexity of the problem space that we're facing. Markov chains are not a silver bullet. I don't use them as such. I don't sell them as such. What I view this as is when I go golfing, I take a full bag of clubs because I will be in the sand trap. I need a sand wedge. I need a you know, different club for different situations. I think Markov chains are a golf club that we as an industry should pick up and start playing with and seeing where it works. So these slides will be available. Um, there's a nice site that I uh, really refer to quite frequently that describes what Markov chains are and how they work. I've got a link to that there. Follow me on Twitter, Better Safety Net is my handle. I'll be sharing some Jupyter uh, notebooks that will walk folks through like how this works, okay? So I really appreciate your time, thank you. We have a few moments that I uh, carved aside for questions. If there's any questions, I'll take them. Don, let me mic you. Yeah, just um, briefly, when you're from an implementation perspective, I mean, most times in SIMS, you just like at time series data, is it usually just you know, these, uh, the notebooks that you're using to 
do the analysis or what what are you what tools are you using to perform the markov analysis on your log data so okay so what tools am i using for time series and what tools am i using for markov in general like you're looking um, at a sim so r- I, real simple how how do you get the data from the sim do the analysis i mean what tools are you using? So I, the tooling that I usually use is what's native in the SIM. So the question is, what tooling do I use? I use the tooling that's available in the SIM, if at all possible. Um, like in Elastic, for instance, I do a lot of my time series analysis using Timeline or Timeline. Um, and um, then for like some of the Markov type stuff, I'm making API calls where I'm querying the Elastic instance and putting it into like a pandas. And then like Python pandas, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a library that basically treats the data as a spreadsheet. So that's how I usually do that. Yep. And then for in um, Sentinel, we do a lot of work in Sentinel. What we will use is Sentinel has some capabilities in there, but then we will also use the Azure log data analytics where you can attach to a a, uh, log analytics workspace for that. Good question. Mick, I have one. Yeah. Um, you emphasize the importance of having deeper subject matter expertise to properly interpret the state changes detected by Markov chain analysis. How do you recommend security teams develop and maintain that critical domain knowledge, especially when dealing with complex evolving threat landscapes? What? Holy crap, that's an amazing question. What, and again, follow on, what strategies can organizations employ to ensure their analysts have the necessary context to effectively leverage these statistical modeling techniques? That's, that's an amazing question. Um, really, I think there's no shortcuts there, unfortunately. If you're going to need domain expertise to be able to challenge the output of these sorts of tools, you need domain expertise. If you don't have that, you need to go find someone or go get it yourself. So talk with folks. Like One of the things that I love about this community is um, almost everyone in the data sciences and detection engineering community is super welcoming. There, there's a couple jerks, but they're rare. That's an awesome question. I have one more. Okay. All right. Mick, you discuss the limitations of simply throwing data at AI, expecting it to solve complex security problems. However, you also acknowledge the computational efficiency and speed of advantages to techniques like Markov chains compared to more advanced machine learning models. How do you recommend security teams strike the right balance between leveraging lightweight statistical methods and incorporating more sophisticated AI ML approaches? What criteria should they use to determine the appropriate analytical tools for different security use cases? So uh, this question actually is a consulting engagement. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Really what you need to do uh, at a very, very high level, you need to start asking um, the amount of effort that we're putting in to get this output, does it make sense that we spend this amount for to get there? One of the things that is really uncomfortable to talk with people about is that like you can do some stuff with neural nets and like even like really crazy deep learning and you can get very high precision results and that's awesome. But using just like saying, hey, this this event was three standard deviations off the mean. That's good enough. That's quick enough. That's cheap. So you start. You have to start doing like the um, how much effort did I take to get this super precise answer, and could I do it via a, a cheaper way? And there's really no shortcut other than just trying it both methods and seeing if you get good enough. One of the things that you'll be hearing from me increasingly more and more is good enough compute. We don't need perfection. We just need good enough. Find the host. Find the user. Then do the investigation on that one. All right, any final questions? Someone from the audience? Okay, I'll be in the Slack, by the way. So thanks for watching, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you.